please uh, buy the book, Nick. I finished it today. It's amazing. And uh, we will send easy links to Nick and to all other books that Michael Farris Smith has written and perhaps even that Josh Kendall has published. And we'll go from there. Um, I want to do a quick intro so we can get on to the main event. Michael Ferris Smith is the author of five other novels, including Blackwood and The Fighter. His novels have appeared on Best of the Year list in Esquire, Southern Living, Book Riot, and numerous other outlets. And before we got on to this event, I was talking to him about telling the audience and all of us a little bit more about the genre of Southern noir. And so hopefully we'll talk about that. Um, Kirkus Review said that Nick is a dark and often gripping story that imagines the narrator of The Great Gatsby in the years before the book began. The new Nick is a man fully realized with a mind tormented by the war and by a first love that waned too fast to a fingernail moon of bitter memory, a compelling character study, and a thoroughly unconventional prequel. Josh Kendall will be interviewing Michael and he is the executive editor as well as the editorial director of Mahalan Books. So without further ado, I'm going to give it over to our guest tonight and be sure you ask questions in the chat box. Thank you, Patty. Thanks, Patty. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be in Connecticut. I've never been to Connecticut before <laughs> now, so it's pretty nice. Um, Looking forward to speaking with you, and thanks to the bookstore for the invite and for the for the love for Nick. I like it too, Patty. Thank you. <laughs> unmute. Uh, Josh needs to unmute. There it's not go. letting. There we go. It wasn't <laughs> letting me unmute. I had the, that moment of panic. I was like, I'm actually <laughs> pressing unmute, and it's not working. And then these little buttons are popping up saying, "You're muted. You're muted," <laughs> and you're like. <laughs> Cursing at the computer, not at you, Michael, or at the other lovely people on the screen. Um, hi, uh, I'm Josh. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm a big fan of RJ Julia. I've been in the store many times. Um, I'm, as I live nearby, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. I've, I've been to Connecticut many times. And um, it's a wonderful community, a wonderful store. Um, it, uh, I think it's great. It's great that we're here. And in some ways, it kind of makes perfect sense. I feel like Nick is the kind of novel for R.J. Julia, for both stores. It just, it feels like the sort of book that um, your customers uh, uh, enjoy. And it's, I think it's a book of conversation. Um, I think it, it might be interesting to talk about. I think this book is maybe in some ways more readily a book of conversation than some of the darker, more noirish, more gothic uh, books because um, it's, its lens is wider, you know, it's, it's sort of a book about the world, um, partly I think because it's historical, but um, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and looking forward to hearing from people in the chat. So thank you. Um, shall we just, Patty, should we just get started and, and going back and forth? Absolutely, go back and forth, whatever's yeah. natural, yeah. keep it organic, it'll be great. Okay, well, I guess one of my first questions for you, Michael, and uh, it's a new one is, uh, I was thinking back uh, in the lead up to this talk tonight, how um, it was about a year ago that we um, we finished work on this book on on editing the book, and um, we were editing it, you know, in fall of uh, 2019 and into the winter of 2020, and we sort of finished the last draft. I feel like it was like in the first weeks of March, um, like late late February March was kind of when it went in, as we say in publishing, went into production. Um, began that production process and then coronavirus hit it was like right at the door knocking on the door you know just as this book went in and then there's this long process leading up to publication and I'm just I'm wondering it's been this really weird year for you and for everyone in the world but I would imagine in this kind of isolation this year of isolation how have your feelings about the book about Nick changed since since you turned it in and, and through now up to publication, have your feelings about Nick as a character and, and Nick as a novel kind of shifted? That's a really good question. And um, it's actually something I was speaking about a little earlier today when I was on a call um, that came out in the UK today. And I was talking to, um, we were doing the live event in London today. And that very question came up because 
I think I mentioned in passing that how, how it does feel different to me now. The novel does, and Nick, somebody asked, I think they asked me about how do you feel about Nick? And I said, I feel different about him today than I did a year ago, which I think we feel, all feel a lot different about things now than we did a year ago. But even like the journey of this novel, for those of, um, to give you guys a little background info, the novel was written five years ago, and then we've been kind of sitting here waiting on it to publish during this time. And when Josh and I went back to work on it, in 19 and up to 20, it kind of felt new again. And I, I found myself feeling rather different about Nick at that point. Um, but he feels, it feels somehow as possible, as, as timely as it could possibly be right now, um, this novel, which is a happy accident that it didn't come out five years ago, that it's coming out now. Because the things that drove me to write about Nick and to take on this story were the feelings that I felt I saw in, in Gatsby and that resonated with me in Gatsby, but I felt loneliness in Gatsby. I felt the isolation in Gatsby. I felt depression. I felt the fragility of things. I just, the, the, everything being on the fringe of breaking down. And the, it was those emotions that I r related to when I read Gatsby five years ago that ultimately drove me to do, to do this. And I feel like those are portrayed in Nick. And I feel like for me to see those, emotions in Gatsby and Nick, then my, my goal, what I wanted to do was create the character who would tell us a story the way he tells us a story and react to things the way he reacts to things. And those feelings of um, disillusionment and loneliness and, and those kind of darker emotions really came out through the telling of it. And like looking at the novel now and like reading passages of it now for events and things, like I feel just how much it resonates with me, like in these days with what we've all been through in the past year. And um, I fit, I, you know, you kind of talked about the scope of, of the novel and yeah. I truly think that Nick is going to always be changing for me. I think it's going to be a novel that's, um, always kind of evolving in my mind. He's going to be a character that I always kind of look at differently depending on, um, where I am with things, which may be even a little different from the way I feel about characters in my other novels, because, um, it was just a different experience writing Nick and creating Nick, um, from this world of Gatsby and taking him and, and sending him propulsively into that world. And um, yeah, I do. It's like, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. I even sat down the other day and I just opened up Gatsby and I read the last chapter of the last four or five pages of Gatsby and, and how it really like just struck me in terms of um, how I feel about Nick now. And after having talked about Nick now for the past month or so, yeah, um, I, I think it'll, it'll always be there. I don't see how it couldn't be, but the timeliness of his character just feels to just be almost nail on the head at this point. Have there been any um, uh, reader responses or, or you know, critic, critics or media responses to the novel that have surprised you? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A positive or negative? I mean, we're, I think we're in a safe space here, you know. Well, it's strange to me because the ones that have surprised me in a negative aspect have come from um, people who deem themselves as like Gatsby experts or like mm -hmm. the academic side. And whereas the more kind of imaginative, creative reviewers and people who aren't from that kind of academic side of things, that kind of lit criticism side of things are reading it very differently. There was a reviewer in the UK who went on, spent the entire review talking about how well, this doesn't sound anything like Fitzgerald. And it was just, that was the constant. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was never intended in any way to sound like Fitzgerald. I mean, that was a very conscious decision in the moment, almost in the moment that I decided to do this. Gatsby's in first person. I'm going to write Nick in third person because I don't want to spend 250 pages trying to mimic F. Scott Fitzgerald, vo vo his voice. What a nightmare that would be. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to back up as Michael Ferris Smith and tell Nick's story in third person so I could look at him from back here and see the things he had experienced and the relationships he had experienced and the people around him. There was yeah. never any intent to be F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I mean, those are kind of uh, really aggravating because, yeah. you know, it's almost like they decided what they're going to write about it before they even read the book, you know? Yeah. The flip side of that is the, the really kind of, uh, in a good way, the reviews that just absolutely just seem to almost be written by either me or you as if <laughs> right. like we know how we feel about the book and how proud of we are of it and how, yeah. how just what we think about it and then to read that in a, in a review from someone who 
is right there with you. It's always kind of interesting to me to, to feel that kind of stretch between me and yeah. that reader on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, yeah, we mentioned, talked about that or just between the two of us earlier. It's just, it really feels like contemporary novelists, like this sort of active, creative contemporary novelists. Like when, when Anthony Doerr reviewed it, we're like, yeah, I, I, I get why Anthony Doerr likes this book, you know, like, look what he's doing, look what he's engaged in. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a sort of creative, restless, curious spirit. And this is, this is sort of a book of curiosity, you know, like a, a work of curiosity. Um, trying to think what, um, did you have, were there, were there models for you? You know, were there other, here are these contemporary novels that were riffing off of classics and you said, okay, you know, uh, so-and-so did this book so I can, I can do that. Or, you know, here was this book that was a riff on Moby Dick. And so I can do, you know, like, and, right. and, or were you just saying, was it a sort of purely personal experience? Here is this book that you read in all these different ways as a growing adult. And it just, it just came from a deeper and more personal place. It came from a deeper and more personal place, but later after the, after the draft was done and I've had, had time to think about it, um, a book that a writer who I really love is Jean Reese, who wrote these great Paris novels of Paris underbelly in the thirties, um, so gritty and poetic. And then in the sixties, she wrote uh, Wide Sargasso Sea, which is a, she basically tells the story of the mad woman in the attic from Jane Eyre. Um, and I love that book and I, I've read it a couple of times and I've read all of her stuff a couple of times. And I think I was really impressed upon that when I read it, how imaginative it was and like how she had seen this character who didn't have her own story and thought she needs her own life. She's not being treated the way, you know, she, there's more to this person. Um, and so I think that was in my subconscious um, somewhere. I didn't think about that kind of until I was down the road and, um, you know, me, me, you know this from me and you talking about it so much, like how, what a close grip, like I kept on this novel when I was working on it and how kind of, I, I was really conscious of like f focusing on it and blocking out any, anything that might distract me from, uh, this kind of very weighty, I thought idea that I had, you know, I, I didn't tell anybody I was working on it. I didn't look up any other novels to see who else was doing any, or had been done like this over time. Um, but I do think Jean, Jean Reese and what she did in Wide Sargasso Sea was in my mind at some point too. And then John, John Gardner wrote a novel called Grendel where he retells, uh, yeah, you know that one? Yeah. He retells Bell. I lo love, I mean, that's one of the like sort of secret classics. Absolutely. I mean, like secret modern classics, yeah. Where he, he retells the, you know, the story of Beowulf from the monster's point of view, first person. And I'd read that years ago, too. And I think that had to be, you know, kind of buried in there somewhere also. Um, as just because I saw it as very inventive and I saw it as very creative and imaginative. And, yeah. um, you know, I, when I'm reading, when I read White Sargasso Sea, I could tell Gene Reese had some very personal, emotional reasons for telling that story. And that's exactly why I wrote Nick. I just got gut punched with emotion five years ago when I read Gatsby again. I was at a place in my life where the thing just hit me in a way I wasn't expecting, which led to me sitting down and doing this. And I felt that in her writing of why it's our gas of sea. Yeah, I think what's, I'm, so I'm sort of the opposite of Michael and that like as an editor uh, and uh, it's sort of my job to be paying attention to everything else rather than the thing in front of me. And then how do I use everything that I've read to inform my editing of this one book of, of, of and Nick. And so I, I'm, I'm a sucker for these kinds of novels. I'll be honest. Like it's whether, whether it's a blind spot for me or not, I don't know, but like novels, contemporary novels that riff off the past, I, like I'm always going to check them out, you know, like even if they're not good, you know, like I, I, I'll say like one, I, I, there's, I, I love the writer Edward Carey, who has this book out now that's sort of reimagining Pinocchio, the Pinocchio story from Geppetto's point of view. I'm not loving that book, <laughs> but I bought it. I'm, I'm reading it because I'll read all of these, but there's just, uh, there's so many of them. One of the things that's interesting is, um, and I'll mention a couple of the others, is they're always pretty short. Mm -hmm. I think that these, these ideas of retellings or revisiting books, they're, I mean, Nick is, of course, about the same length as Gatsby, because Gatsby is very short in itself. But um, 
you mentioned Grendel and Sargasso Sea, and I think it's like both those books are under 200 pages. Like Grendel might even be like 100 or 100, 120. It's they're real short. But um, you know, there's there's a, a book Master and Margarita by Bulgakov, which is a little bit longer, but it's riffing off of the Bible as well as all these other things. Or you know, um, uh, uh, Jam Kurtzia, the South African novelist who wrote a uh, a book riffing off of Dostoevsky called The Master of Petersburg, which is like this really condensed tight thing. Um, I just, I think this, this idea of fertility across eons, across all these years, across all these different kinds of cultures is just endlessly fascinating, whether it's in novels or whether it's in music or whether it's in any kind of artistic form. Um, well, the timeliness of, I mean, the timeless, timelessness of them is there and the experience of mine in writing through Nick was, you know, I, I wasn't intrigued by the glitz and the glamour and the parties of, of Gatsby. I, it was those, it was those feelings of, like I've talked about the loneliness, the detachment, those things. And mm. the more I've, you know, I, we had time to say, I had, I've had five years to sit around and think about it, waiting on this novel to come out. And the more I've thought about it, I, I think perhaps that's what makes Gatsby um move from generation to generation because we have all we all experience those feelings and we all know what those emotions are like and we all know what it's like to be fragile and to be vulnerable and to be um feel alone um and to try to recover from things that we've experienced and I, I, to me that's the thing that will keep yatsby you know being read so you know when i kind of uh latched on to those things i felt like it was um you know just a matter of uh, continuing to tell the same type of story that we kind of tell over and over again, you know, it's something that comes from deep down inside. I think you were saying from the very start when we started working on the book, in fact, I think when I acquired it, because we, the other thing is, so in publishing, as, as some of you know, listening to these talks with editors and the writers, sometimes these books are acquired by the editor and the publisher long before they're published. And in this case, um, we bought, we acquired, I acquired two books from Michael and it was Blackwood and it was, Ga it was uh, Nick. And so there was a version of Nick that we acquired, I guess, three years ago now, right? Because it was like, it was, um, it was when we bought, when we acquired Blackwood and we said, okay, let's do Blackwood first because we have to wait for the Fitzgerald um, uh, um, copyright to expire. And, and we had that two year runway and then the year to work on Nick. Um, but um, I think it might be useful to talk a little bit about like the editorial process between us. Um, I think this was a different, so I've, I've edited three of Michael's, not the last three novels uh, of Michael's. Uh, that was The Fighter, Blackwood, and, and this one. And I think in this book, it, it, was, it was probably the most editorial work. Like Blackwood, we did some restructuring. Sorry for the kid noise in the background, by the way, guys. Um, you heard him in the bathroom getting his nighttime bath and now the door is swung open and he's going to be shortly running around the apartment naked. And here he is. Um, sorry about this guys. Um, yeah, daddy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, fighter was a sort of diamond sharp, totally sort of, sort of perfect little thing, which was the most noirish of them. Here's a very noir moment, um, with the kid running in, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then, and then Blackwood is this very weird sort of almost like it's dark, it's noir, it's gothic, but it's sort of magical realist. It has elements of horror. So there was a lot of like playfulness in that editorial process. What could we shift? What characters could we bring forward? And then with Nick, it was like, okay, this guy comes back from the war. What do we want to do with a story once he arrives in New Orleans? And it was kind of an open playing field. What was your kind of experience as the writer in that relationship between us over those three books, how is it different from the work you did on the previous three, three books? I guess, well, the first book wasn't the novel, but you know, I guess with Rivers and with Desperation Road, like how, what have been the, the differences in your experience? Well, I think the large difference in editing Nick that made it different from really every other novel is that it's more episodic. The scope is bigger, um, whereas, Every one of my other novels, the time frame is very compressed. You know, yeah. I think Rivers yeah. is seven days. I think Desperation Road is like four days or five days. The Fighters 
a week and a half. Yep. I think Blackwood maybe covers the stretch of a month or so. Um, but, you know, Nick, we're talking about moving someone from, from World War I to Paris, back home to New Orleans, back home, and eventually um, in New York, to New York. And it covers not just a mo movement in place, but also like movement in time and like some mm. very big pieces. Like World War I is a very big set piece, yeah. you know. His experience in Paris with Ella is a very big set piece. And same thing for New Orleans. It's a big, big set piece, you know, and, and then transitioning that. Um, so for me, that was the biggest um, thing. It's almost like I remember like when we would be talking about it and like I'd be thinking about your notes, I almost kind of looked at it in, in terms of like, okay, let me fix this. Let's work on, let me think about this capsule first. Let me think about Paris first and let me kind of focus on it and do it before I really think about anything else. And then let me work, you know, really focus on New Orleans this week and make sure I get new, you know, um, lay into that the way I need to, because I mean, and that's what made it different. Whereas when we're talking about Blackwood or the fighter or whatever, you're kind of talking about, it's a, you know, it's a novel, but it's like all kind of one world that we're like right in all the time. Yeah. Whereas Nick was like world, 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 world that we had to, you know, thread together and make, you know, getting them to agree and feed off of one another was really the thing that made it um, made it different. And I, I think it's the thing I really liked about it also. It was, you know, different is good. And I, you know, I, I, we were creating these worlds like we've done in the other novels, but it was like a few worlds inside a novel versus like the novel being the world itself. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a great way of putting it. I never I thought about it. I, as you say that, I feel like some of those earlier books are almost like theater. You know, it's like everything's happening on that stage and it's held by the stage and by the theater and that you have an hour and a half or whatever. And that Nick is like an epic movie, <laughs> you know, like, or, or, or you know, a, a, a limited series over these, ep you know, these kinds of episodes. It's the, the, the canvas is um, so much larger and, and we, you don't have the ticking clock where I think, even with Blackwood where there's, in Blackwood, which is, you know, essentially about this town or this region and there's a cast of five or six different characters and each one's kind of coming to the fore at different sections. There's a sort of ticking clock because there's this kind of very ominous, threatening kind of almost horror motif of, is, you know, these children, these two boys disappear and then the love interest disappears and, are they being murdered and who's coming under suspicion? You're going into this direction, but with, with Nick, you're only going towards the great Gatsby. <laughs> you're going towards this kind of yeah. openness at the ending. We knew that the ending was going to be very wide open. Right. Um, the other thing too is like, you know, Nick really came about because of my love for the lost generation and, you know, the impact of the lost generation on both my life and my work and, you know, a lot, I've talked a lot about my Southern influences being a Mississippi writer, but my very first influences were the expatriates because of my living abroad when I like really became a serious reader and I knew enough about, you know, books to know, well, if I'm in Paris for a while, if I'm going to be in France for a year or two and I, maybe I should, I'll, I'll read some Lost Generation stuff, you know, so it was, it was not only it was the episodic nature, but I also felt like I was speaking to an era in writing Nick also. Mm, you know, mm. there was a lot to gather in this book for me. I mean, there was a lot, um, a lot of, there were a lot of balls being juggled in the air at the same time, but I really thought I want that, you know, I, I hope this will be like a lost generation novel. I want to capture the era, era that we are dealing with also, as well as, you know, I mean, setting and atmosphere and all that is always a huge part of what I do, but this yeah. was like, you're talking about when just using the phrase lost generation you know all the things that come with that yeah and I, I really wanted to encapsulate that in, in this novel as a whole so it was a story it was an era it was a character it was connections from one book to another it was a, it was a lot of different stuff were there any were there any nonfiction like like history books that you were reading um that were informative from a research standpoint because i thought if people on the call were really got you know were into this novel and they wanted to kind of know more about that beyond the other writers of that era, the novelists of that other era right were there sort of encapsulating books that were useful for you there was a book there's a book called dixie bohemia uh -huh. um, that is about new orleans in 19 
in, during that time, 1915 to 1920. And it's about kind of the, uh, um, the bohemian nature of New Orleans during that time and the artists and writers who were there and also kind of what the culture was like and what the streets were like and what the prostitution was like. I mean, it's, it's really kind of incredible. And I read that book to like, give me a real sense. Well, to first learn about New Orleans, like yeah. I'm going to send him there. I really want to know what it's, what it was like. That was very, uh, a striking read. And I would recommend that to anybody who wants to know about New Orleans during that, during that time period. Um, but then I did, I watched, I wish I could remember the name of it. I watched a documentary on YouTube about uh, the tunnelers in World War One. when I wanted, uh, to, get, I wanted yeah. when I wanted to give Nick a, I wanted, you know, put him in the war, but I wanted him to have a specific job. I wanted him to do something very particular. And when I found out about the tunnels and the tunnelers and what a, I mean, the whole war was a nightmare, but the tunnels was certainly a different kind of nightmare. I watched a documentary on what it was like to, to uh, be a part of the war beneath the war. Um, yeah. That was really, uh, really impactful um, to me because it honestly, like going into the tunnels was pretty much like a death sentence, you know, uh, whether you volunteered for it or were just sent down in there. It was almost yeah. like once you go into the tunnels, you're not coming out. I mean, the, yeah. the, the mortality rate was incre just incredible. Um, so Dixie Bohemia, and then I watched a documentary about the tunnelers and their job and their impact on, on World War I. I, and again, you know, I feel this way. The, the, all the material in this book in the tunnels is just it. I mean, there's so much that's extraordinary about this this novel. But you, anyone who hasn't read this book, you've never read a novel. You've never read that experience of what it's like to be a soldier in the tunnels under the World War II, under the battlefields of World War One. Excuse me. Um, it's it's utterly singular. Yeah, it, it was really interesting to me. And I knew when I stumbled upon it, that was exactly what I wanted him to do. Because like you said, I'd never read about it in a novel before. I was completely unfamiliar with it. And, you know, I wanted to be true to the war. You know, the novel was also influenced by a line um, from A Movable Feast when Hemingway says, we didn't trust anyone who wasn't in the war. And the very first connection Gatsby and, and Nick make is they ask each other, where were you in the war? Um, who were you with? And I just saw that, you know, it's something behind their eyes that they this connection they make. And so the logical place for me was to put him in World War I and let's go from there. And I wanted to create it as realistically as I possibly could without the romance or without the, um, you know, Hollywood um, depiction of it. And reading about the tunnels and watching about the tunnels was completely eye-opening to me about the risk um, and the trauma that these, these people endured. The whole thing was an eye opener for me in, in a lot of ways. I'd never written a historical novel. I mean, my, yeah. my, uh, up until this novel, my whole philosophy on research is if I don't know the answer, I Google it. And if I can't find the answer in about 10 seconds, I either cut it out or make it up, you know? Yeah. It yeah. Was, couldn't do that with Nick, um, which I learned. It was an extraordinary experience to to learn and to kind of have to do homework, but also then make it be very real and dreamlike in a, in a novel. Did Nick? Does Nick make you want to write other historicals in the future? Uh, no, it does not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Good to know as your publisher. Yeah. <laughs> Good like to I noted. Said, I didn't like homework before Nick, and while I did it, I don't. I still don't like homework. <laughs> good, 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 good answer. Um, Patty, did you want to um, uh, jump in with uh, questions from RJ Julie or questions from, from the audience? We have quite a few. Great. Um, someone asked Michael, "Can Michael talk about if and how much intimidation he felt approaching the world of such a classic?" Ah, uh, yes, I can. Um, You're pretty daunting, don't you think? It was very daunting. In fact, when I knew I was going to do it, like the second thought I had was, are you sure you want to do it? I mean, it was just, it was that simple, a matter of fact, because I realized the, the literary weight of it. I realized the heft of it. And I realized the target it would put out there um, on your back. And I realized that everybody that comes to the novel is probably going to have some idea um, or some opinion of, before they even start it, um, which is different, I think, from, you know, 
an, another reading experience. Um, uh, in the beginning of it, uh, I felt it a little heavier, but once I started writing the novel, um, it began to flake away as the creative process began. Mm. And I just really began to feel, let the imagination and the creation of it and the enjoyment of it taking over. I mean, the, when I thought about those things and I'm, you know, they, they came and went the whole time. They came and went up until the day of publication. And they probably, I probably had those same thoughts today at some point, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I had, I had, I told myself, you've got two options. You were emotionally drawn to this thing to the point where you're not going to stop thinking about it, which is really the only criteria I have for writing a novel. I know that when I'm feeling it and when I can't stop thinking about it, that that's the thing I need to, to, to write about and engage with. Um, and I was like, you can either embrace this with all the talent and all the stamina, all the guts you can muster and do it to the best of your ability, or you can shrink away from it, think it's too big and it's too tough. And for the rest of your life, you'll probably wonder what would have happened if you would have done it. And for me, I just wasn't going to let being afraid of it be the reason that I, that I didn't do it. Um, so I just dove in and, you know, here we are, um, to say it was definitely daunting, but uh, part of me said that's why you should go ahead and do it too. I'll, I'll also say in Michael's defense, when when he mentioned that this book existed, I don't know if you remember this, but you almost mentioned to it, it to me apologetically, <laughs> like you know, it's like I had Blackwood; it's been sent to me by his agent, and you said, "Well, you know, I've got this other thing that I've been sitting on," um, and he said, "You know, it's 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 a novel that's sort of connected to Great Gatsby. Would you be in, you wouldn't be interested in that, would you?" <laughs> and I, I, I laughed. I was like, "Are you kidding me? This is." Exactly. Yes. Please send it in. <laughs> um, and I think uh, to, to Michael's credit, he just he was writing it in this kind of um, hermeneutically sealed, like monkish, you know, uh, 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 bubble. And um, he wasn't writing it thinking, oh, you know, this is going to get lots of readers or, oh, this is going to be commercial or, oh, you know, the intelligentsia or the academia academics will be after me. He just kind of said, I have this weird thing. Are you interested? And and it, I think I was like, he, maybe he was surprised when I was like, this isn't weird. This is perfect. This is exact. This is totally what we would want. Yeah. Um, so I still, I just am tickled by him, sort of br having mentioned that in this in this kind of apologetic way. Do you do you want to see this? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it would have stayed hidden. Maybe he would have published it under another name. You know, I don't know. But um, I'm really happy he didn't. This is. It, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you didn't, I'm glad you didn't flinch too. It wasn't, yeah. just, it wasn't just me not flinching, but it was Josh and it was everybody at Little Brown not flinching also. I do. I think people, you know, just as many, just if there are people who might resent a book like this being written, there are people who who love it. Like we said, people love this kind of thing. I, you know, I remember Ahab's wife and thinking like, and I loved Moby Dick is still one of my favorite books, but I was like, God, Ahab's wife was totally different, but it was wonderful. It was like magical, like. I'm so glad it was written or cold mountain. I'm so glad the cold mountain was written. Mm -hmm. I don't resent it because it's not the odyssey, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, Good question. Good question. Okay. We have another one, um, which I'm sure you've heard a lot. Uh, can you talk to us about the cover art? The eyes are wide open. It's a stark contrast to the great Gatsby. Is there a backstory about the cover art? Um, I'll let Josh probably answer that a little bit because they have a habit of showing it to me when it's they're real happy about it and they don't want me yeah. to argue about it and <laughs> so he kind of knows what went on behind the scenes a little bit more I will say that the eyes when I saw the eyes and the kind of fire and like I said I was like those are Nick's eyes those are Nick's wide open war-torn ravaged eyes when I saw it um but I'll let Josh mention like the thought process that was going on in the house yeah, I mean, I think with most of these, uh, you, well, not all with all every book, you know, there's this long process that begins with a kind of brainstorm session that happens, um, in, you know, in the before times in person in the office, where there's the editor for the book, you know, there's the editor's boss, the publisher and editor in chief in this in this conference room. And then there's a bunch of people from the art department, you know, maybe there's someone who's the head of marketing. And the editor sort of brings up a couple of different concepts. They're like, well, maybe something like this and maybe something like this. And they bring in 
other titles by other novels saying maybe something like this novel or maybe something like this. And um, it wasn't like that with this book. I think I went in with two, just two kind of thoughts, which was, you know, I, the World War One battlefields, there are plenty of novels like this, um, you know, very long engagement was this novel that was kind of in the back of my mind, a wonderful World War One novel. Um, and, and there is that sort of images of the trench war for battlefields that was one that was a kind of traditional historical novel idea and then the other was let's play with them um, let's play with Gatsby let's embrace what it's trying to do and um, the other big component is there's this guy I work with named Greg Kulik um, you can you can find him online Greg with two g's at the end and Greg Kulik is um, just as brilliant artist and jacket designer who um you know, chances are, if you love a Little Brown or a Mulholland book cover, he's probably one of the, he's, you know, 80% chance he's one of the designers. He's just absolutely brilliant. Everything he does is brilliant. And I, I just said to my boss, please, God, give this book to Greg, you know, like, and, and it's, I don't get to choose. My boss doesn't even get to choose. I just was praying it would be given to Greg because I knew, I knew he would get this kind of book. I knew he'd come up with something really interesting and I knew it would be pretty. And, um, and so when it was given to him, yeah, like he just was off to the races. He came with this idea. You know, I knew right away. I was like, it's the blue. It's the blue from the book I had in high school. You know, it's a version of the eyes from the book I had in high school. And yet it feels fresh and modern. And I think that the openness is that wide openness of this book is so, of the cover is so important. And, um, and, uh, and as someone said, the openness, the, that, that wide open eyes, this idea that Nick is a vulnerable creature. And those eyes convey his vulnerability was um, important. It also made it feel like it was very much a book about right now. It was historical, but um, you know, like we wanted those eyes to be any any kind of American man, vulnerable man's eyes. You know, like look at what look at what we're capable of. Both the beauty and the horror of what Americans and American men are still capable of, and um, and we wanted the book to. Um, to get that. So uh, it's just to say, God bless Greg Kulik. <laughs> this is, sometimes, you know, one person can really, you know, be the linchpin for these things. And, and, and he was one of them for this. Hey, this is an interesting question. If you hadn't lived in Paris, would you have set that part elsewhere? Mm. And can you talk more about writing setting in general, writing places you know versus places you haven't lived? Um, that's a really nice question. I would say if I hadn't lived in Paris, then none of this would have probably ever happened. Um, uh, you know, I, I was living abroad in my 20s and I was really lost and rambling and I had no interest in anything. And I just started reading, honest to God, because I saw people in the cafes and on the trains and sitting in the park reading. And I just decided to do it, start to help pass the time. Um, and I spent four or five years just reading. And it was during that time that um, you know, that city meant a lot to me. Um, being that far from home meant a lot to me because it helped me change the way I thought about things in a, in a good way. Even, you know, just it helped me kind of figure out um, what the hell I wanted to do. And for some reason, I felt myself drawn to try to write. I still can't ex explain why that happened, um, but it did. And so the impact of those writers and the impact of that place has always been on my mind. My very first book, The Hands of Strangers, a novella was set in Paris because I, I wrote it not long after I had um, been living there. So it was very fresh in my mind. And then um, my wife and I and my children, we've been back several times to the city and I've gotten to show them where I used to live and take my girls to the parks where I used to hang out. And <laughs> um, the, without that influence, I'd, there's there's just no way this novel would have been written i don't think um i'm i'm a proponent of writing about places um you know because you can capture the mood and the feel and the atmosphere and the nooks and crannies in a way that you couldn't otherwise i mean there's nothing you know worse to me than like opening up a a, a short story or a, about you know set in london and the three places mentioned are you know, Big Ben and, uh, <laughs> you know, London Bridge and, you know, whatever, you know, 
other, you know, in a pub. I mean, come mm -hmm. on, there's more to it than that, you know? And you can tell when someone is invested and when someone has an experience with a place and when someone um, has that dirt under their fingernails, so to speak. Um, I, I would never have said it anywhere that I was unfamiliar with because I want, I want it to be dreamlike and authentic. And for me, those places that I know offer me those opportunities. And I, I think emotions of a place are important too. I think most of the settings I write about, I'm emotionally attached to in some way also, which gives, which makes it very enjoyable for me as a writer. I mean, there's enough I got to deal with already. So writing, a, writing about a place that I know and adore for its beauty or its ugliness, either one, um, is always um, something that I really look forward to doing. But without, without that experience abroad and without Paris and all that, there's no, I don't, this novel wouldn't even exist. I probably would have come to writing at some point either way, but this novel I doubt would have happened. Okay, this is another question about location. How much did you focus on researching The Great Gatsby for your novel? And do you have an opinion on whether it was set in F. Scott's time in Westport or on Long Island? Um, well, this is gonna sound weird, but after when I read Gatsby in 2015, when it, or 14, when it had the tremendous impact on me, and I sat down right away and started working on Nick, I was almost careful not to read it for a while. Like I, I just worked on Nick for a while, maybe all the way through a first draft before I read it again, um, just to see how things were measuring up. I'm always real afraid of, and this is why research kind of bothers me some, not bothers me, but why I, I haven't always done a lot is I'm kind of afraid of what reality is going to do to my imagination. And I was afraid if I kept opening up Gatsby every week and looking at it and kind of measuring it against what I was doing that, it was going to really screw with the vision I had going on in my mind for what um, what I was trying to do. Um, I did go back and read it again right before Josh and I um, started working on the revision in 19, just again to feel, see if, you know, is this the way you remember it? I know it, is it, are, are things syncing up the way you, you thought they were? And, and it was right, right there, you know, for me again. Um, and I, I think that's just a, uh, me, I think that was a way for me to let go also. Going, to going back to the question about feeling the weight and the pressure of it, I think not having Gatsby right there on my, on my desk looking at it, you know, when I was or opening it up very often when I was working on Nick allowed me to some freedom and I think uh, allowed the anxiety to, to shred away a little bit um, when I was working on it. And, you know, I opened it, I told you I opened it up the other day and just read the last four or five chapters our four or five pages, which is something I haven't done in a while. And I was really moved by how it felt in relation to, to Nick. And uh, that made me very proud. And I think it validated what I've done, done too. Um, there's a million ways to do it, but a lot of times the way I choose to do it is almost ignore um, the, the target and um, let something else take over. For whatever it's worth, that's also what E.L. Doctorow always recommended too. You know, the sort of master of historical fiction. He 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 was on the record, I think, in his Harris Review interview, um, saying he never does any research about the time periods of those those big sprawling historicals. He writes the whole novel first, and then he goes and reads the history and says, "What what do I have to change in the book in order to make it match the history, or what what should be rewritten?" He never he never wants it to come through. You know to to impede the initial creative process. Um, I always found that interesting. Read the history books after you wrote the, not, the first draft. Right, that's interesting because I think it gives you the propulsion, you know, it doesn't bog you down. It doesn't slow you down. I, I, I know a friend of mine writes historical, has written a couple of historical novels and it will take him forever just to get through a chapter because he spends so much time making sure every little thing is right. Whereas, uh, you know, like doctoral and like myself, I'd rather keep the, keep the juices flowing and then let's go back and, you know, figure out what they were eating or how they were getting there. Yeah. Get yeah. There. That's sort of, that's the, like the editor brain that gets in the way of writing it. <laughs> you know, you got to get that like punctiliousness out of your head and just, and just be that artist, just be that unfettered artist first. Then you can get really mean with yourself. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Okay. We have just a couple more questions. I wanted to get back to what I talked about um, when we did the interaction uh, by your introduction about Southern noir writing and what that means. Um, what other 
authors that you know about that write in that genre mm. maybe you can plug in also in tandem to that what are you both reading what's on your bedside table uh the first part of the southern noir thing um well i'll talk about like influences first that i think people will probably relate to a little quicker is um uh cormac mccarthy mm. uh, william faulkner uh william gay oh, yeah. uh, either even say flannery o'connor um carson mccullers the ballad of the sad cafe to me is a beautiful example of um kind of southern noir you know i think for me it's it's a lot of uh it's a lot of um it's a lot of landscape it's a lot mm -hmm. of uh um kind of desolate landscapes um i think it's desolate people in desperate situations i think it's it can be a blend of of somebody doing something wrong it can be a blend of whispers in the night it can be a something of ghost stories and haunted yeah. tales or it can be straight up just hardcore violence for the sake of violence or it can be all of those things um it's a you know it's a it's a genre i've been drawn to as a reader i love those things because i think they also i think what southern noir does to it it also gets into the spiritual aspect of things faulkner did that mccarthy does that and the kind of the things that challenge us spiritually and so uh psychologically and emotionally I think also falls right in the framework of Southern Noir and, and what it does and um, the kind of the, uh, not message it presents, but um, the experience it presents. I would also, if I were to mention a couple of uh, other dead writers um, or recently dead, uh, I'd put Harry Cruz and Larry Brown in that, oh, yes. in that category too. Um, both of them wrote many books. Um, Harry Cruz actually, there was a, a tremendous memoir of his that was published posthumously um that is is also pretty terrific um the other person who's kind of on the fringes of this because he's not technically in the south he lives in the ozarks is danny woodrell yeah. and and dan is a big um advocate for for michael and um danny woodrell's books are tremendous terrific he actually wrote one sprawling historical novel himself um but his first three novels actually were all set in Louisiana in the bayou. And um, conveniently enough, Mulholland has a, a omnibus edition of all three books in one called the Bayou Trilogy. Um, but the cool thing about those books is they're straight noir. They're crime novels. People don't think of, you know, Woodrell who wrote Winter's Bone as a crime writer, mm -hmm. though there's crime in all of his novels. Um, but those were straight up crime novels set in Louisiana. Um, why he did that when he's always lived in, in Missouri, I don't know. But um, or Arkansas, I mean, but uh, it's, um, he's a tremendous writer. Anything you read of his, if you never read Winter's Bone, the novel, and just saw the movie, which is also great, do yourself a favor and read Winter's Bone, which I think of really as, as Southern noir as well. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and there's a bunch of other writers that Michael knows in his, in his area. Um, you know, there's Jason Gay is another one. Um, uh, uh, Tom, um, was Tom, you know, wrote Poachers, Michael, Tom, uh, Tom Franklin, Tom Franklin, excuse me. Yep. Tom Franklin's another great one. Um, it's a really fertile ground. There's even some people who are kind of, there's a guy in, um, in Texas, um, whose name's not going to jump away from me. Uh, um, um, Gabino Iglesias. Yeah. Who writes horror novels that are sort of Southern noir that turn into horror. He's only written two novels. Um, both by a small press, but uh, Gabino is a really interesting writer. If you can, if you can stomach um, the violence, mm -hmm. um, they're playing with noir in a very cool way too. Yeah, it, it's a flexible field. You know, some of it is more crime oriented, and some of it is more kind of landscapey, ha haunted oriented. I think uh, you know, Truman Capote's novel "Other Voices, Other Rooms" mm. is southern noir as you can get too. It's just a beautiful old spooky, spooky novel. You know. Um, so yeah it's it's a flexible genre which is i guess why i don't mind being mentioned <laughs> because it can, it can be you know there's certainly core aspects of it but it's it's flexible i also think there's more humanity in it than a lot of noir i i edit a lot of noir with my other with my other hat on and i think and i love i love straight up conventional old-fashioned noir but um southern noir because there's a spiritual element because it's very much about um, the ghosts of the past, the metaphorical ghosts of the past, you know, wreaking havoc on these characters present. 
and it's about suffering and human suffering. There's a lot of empathy in these books. Um, they're very, almost every one of these writers we've talked about are just heartstrong writers. Mm -hmm. um, they're very psychological and emotional. Yeah, I agree. Uh, as far as what I'm reading now, I've been reading some nonfiction lately. I think um, over the past couple of months, I've just really kind of wanted to engage with stories of people who kind of did their own thing again, you know, no matter what, which kind of, I guess, goes back to the very first question we got about me doing this in the first place. And just what, you know, engaging and trying to engage through books with people who are interesting and um, willing to take chances and um, kind of cut their own path. Um, I read just before Christmas, I'd been putting it off, but I finally read uh, Patty Smith's memoir, Just Kids, um, mm. which is just beautiful. Um, and then I've been reading a new biography about uh, Harry Dean Stanton, the actor and his life and career, which is really interesting. Um, and then um, there's a book called Pappy Land by my friend Wright Thompson. Oh. Who writes for? I, I have I, that's on my list for coming up to read. Yeah, yeah. good. He, he, he's known for writing for ESPN, but um, and doing some of their thirty for thirty stuff. But he writes about the Bourbon Empire of uh, the Pappy Van Winkle Bourbon Empire, which wasn't always an empire. And that Wright's book really surprised me in the best of ways. It, the the humanity and the personal touches and the kind of the correlations he makes through that book were really surprising to me, and it really came off very nicely. Um, so those are three I guess I've, I've been reading or read that's great uh, I, I'm working my way through the Ali Smith uh, trilogy um, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm loving on the recommendation of of my my partner here and um, read the first two of the four and um, they utterly blew me away uh, I they're I, I love them because they're sort of impossible to talk about or describe I don't even as an editor I don't even understand how these books work um, how they work as novels. Uh, they feel just so free flowing and unformed in the most liberating way. You feel like you're just living a kind of crazy life and then the emotion sneaks up on you. They're all very short. The, the emotion sneaks up on you. The, the, last, the, scene, the last scenes in each of these first of those two novels, I think the first one's Autumn. Um, and um, they just sneak up in you and just completely punch you in the gut. Uh, at the end, um, and they're lovely. And then I'm reading, also I like to go back and forth with nonfiction. I'm actually reading a biography of um, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, I forgot the title, it has a very general title, it just came out uh, this year, which is incredible. Talking about like literary circles, you know, he was part of the Bloomsbury circle with um, Virginia Woolf. And, um, and he was this like economist philosopher. He shaped, he shaped modern economy. Um, and uh, I'm loving that book. Uh, I, I love biography. I'm really looking forward actually to the Philip Roth biography that's coming out soon. Um, that's actually by an old author of mine, Blake Bailey. Um, he and I worked together about 15, 20 years ago on his first book, um, which was about Richard Yates, who's another one of my favorite old writers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I give a shout out for any, any of Blake Bailey's books, his biographies or his memoir um, are incredible. The Cheever biography, which I have, just to my right is that he wrote is amazing. Okay, that's helpful. We're gonna, I think this is a, a great last question to wrap up the evening. One of our guests tonight said um, she hasn't read The Great Gatsby and would it be okay to read Nick? Is, is it a standalone book you can read without reading Gatsby? Uh, that's, that's a, a good really good question. Yeah, like one of the other, of the many balls to juggle in writing this novel is I wanted Nick to feel like a standalone novel as well because mm. not everybody's read Gatsby or not everybody remembers Gatsby and I wanted Nick to be its own experience um, aside from that too obviously there's a connection but yeah I think you can read Nick as a standalone um, novel and it's been nice to like hear some of the reviews say that too to point out you don't even need to be familiar with Gatsby to in be immersed in this in the experience of it and if you're thinking of reading if people are wondering like what order they should read them in too. that question. Like I've been telling people, um, you know, read Nick first and then read Gatsby because I think the way uh, Nick tells us the story in Gatsby, um, you'll have more to think about after reading Nick, if you read Nick first and then Gatsby. And then the people, the people I've told to do that or suggest to do that who have done it have said, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's the way to do it. 
But yeah, you can pick up Nick and begin on page one and with no knowledge of Gatsby whatsoever, and you'll be just off, you'll be just fine. And we'd love you to buy it from RJ's. Make sure to look in your chat box down below. And we linked all the books that you guys mentioned. Um, so many great recommendations. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation um, and for visiting us in Connecticut. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You have Thank signed you. copies, correct? Pardon me? Well, you have signed copies too, correct? We do. Actually, we have some signed copies. I don't know how many, but we will we'll sort of double check on that. I know this one is signed, so I'll have to bring it back to the bookstore. <laughs> um, very limited copies. So check in with us at the store tomorrow. We'll make sure if we have them that we get them out to you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you both. Thanks, Patty. Thanks all. Thanks, Bye -bye. John. Thank have you. a great night.